Right now, the GPU market is in a dire state where we desperately need a shakeup. One could argue that it's due to the lack of competition, and that's definitely true. However, if you take a look at retailer listings, you'll find various options in all segments, except for the very top end. AMD's Jack Hewn recently spoke about the future of the Radeon Technologies Group, explaining how the company plans to no longer strive to be king of the hill, but instead focus on a scalable strategy to address its market share problems. At a glance, it seems like a viable strategy, but when you consider AMD's broader actions, some glaring pitfalls could backfire. In this video, I'll explore the pros and cons of AMD's new direction while also addressing recent developments that suggest this entire approach might just be a PR spin to cover up deeper inefficiencies. Hey, if you enjoy content like this, drop a like, make sure to subscribe, and smash that bell so you never miss another video. Hey, what is going on guys? Danny here. Welcome back to the channel and I hope you've all been doing well. We've now entered Q4 of 2024 and we're almost at that two year mark since we saw a new generation of graphics cards from Nvidia and AMD. For Team Green, despite all the pricing controversies and consumer outcry, they've done quite well for themselves. However, the same can't be said for AMD and their Radeon Technologies group. With RDNA 4, whatever they choose to roll out, it's imperative they hit a home run. As it truly feels like AMD AMD is hanging on by just a few threads for whatever market share they have left in the discrete GPU segment, and I don't think it's really facetious to say that. Over these past few months, we've been hearing several rumors talk about how AMD has cancelled their enthusiast or high-end RDNA 4 graphics cards, and that we'll only be seeing mid-range, mainstream, and budget cards from them. A strategy we have seen AMD employ before, such as with the Polaris-based GPUs like the RX 480, which turned out to be one of their best-selling cards, and we also saw them do this with RDNA 1 that yielded cards like the 5700 XT and RX 5700, which seemed like viable alternatives to Nvidia's RTX 2070 Super and the 2060 Super. Navi 48 and Navi 44. These are the alleged codenames for these upcoming RDNA 4 GPUs. And what's interesting with these codenames is they're not going to be following the usual GPU hierarchy. Typically, the smaller codename refers to the bigger chip, and then as you go up the stack, the chip gets smaller. So for example, Navi 31 is your 7900 XTX and 7900 XT. And then you'll have your Navi 33 chip, which is what GPUs like the RX 7600 and 7600 XT were based on. But this time, Navi 48 is supposed to be the larger chip, and Navi 44 is going to be the smaller one. I'm not sure why they reversed it, but it doesn't even matter as at the end of the day, people usually refer to the cards by the retail model. When it comes to architectural changes with RDNA 4, there's not a whole lot of information that's out at this point, and if we're being honest with ourselves, even if there was, how much faith do you guys have in it? When with RDNA 3, AMD made bold claims suggesting a large 50% performance per watt leap, showing gaming graphs with up to or max FPS rather than averages, and so on. That wasn't the first time either. We saw this happen with RX Vega when AMD talked about primitive shaders and DSBR, which weren't even active in the final products. Now, according to rumors, RDNA 4 isn't going to be a huge overhaul in the architecture that some might expect. Apparently, it's supposed to be fixing a lot of the stuff that was broken in RDNA 3, and also include a new ray tracing pipeline. We'll find out soon enough what RDNA 4 brings to the table once it's released and tested. Paul Alcorn, who's a hardware reviewer and editor over at Tom's Hardware, had the chance to chat with AMD's Jack Hewen, AMD's Senior Vice President and General Manager of Computing and Graphics Business Group, where his comments sketched out a plan focusing specifically on gaining market share in the GPU market above all else, and this strategy deprioritizes chasing NVIDIA's highest end gaming graphics cards. When asked if AMD are committed to competing at the top of the stack with Nvidia, Jack replied saying AMD is in a different position, and what they're looking at now is scale, because when they have scale, they bring developers with them. His number one priority with AMD is to go after scale, get them to 40-50% to 50 of the market, rather than go after the 10% who just buy the high end. He specifically mentions he doesn't want AMD to be the company that only people who can afford Porsches and Ferraris can buy. They tried the King of the Hill strategy before, and it hasn't worked out as they had hoped it would. He talks about how without scale, they can't get developers on board. Going with the 10% means abandonment, whereas with the 40-50% to 50 market share, they can get developers on board who will be incentivized to optimize for their hardware to ensure their player base, who then would be a big portion of Radeon users, are
are getting the right experience. Paul then asked for the data center, you're still planning to go for King of the Hill, right? To which he replied, of course, we have to because that's performance per dollar. Even Microsoft said ChatGPT4 runs the fastest on MI300. Here's the thing, in the service space, when we have absolute leadership, we gain share because it's very TCO based. Very interesting. Now we're going to be talking about the strategy a bit later, but before that I wanted to touch upon a follow-up article which was posted by Tom's Hardware where they had included some more discussion between them and AMD's SVP. And this Jack talks about how AMD will be unifying both their RDNA and CDNA architectures to UDNA. Now for those of you who weren't aware, RDNA is their client-focused architecture for things like gaming GPUs and iGPUs and desktop CPUs or mobile laptops. And then CDNA was geared towards the data center, HPC, and AI. Now, there are some other tidbits here and there, but their main reasoning, he states, is that it will be so much easier for developers versus today, where they have to choose and value is not improving. It's a cloud to client strategy, and I think it will allow us to be very efficient too. So instead of having two teams do it, you have one team. It's not doing something that that's crazy, right? We forked it because we wanted to micro-optimize in the near term, but now that we have scale, we have to unify back, and I believe it's the right approach. There might be some little bumps on the way. Circling back to AMD's scalable strategy, looking on the surface, it's a sensible strategy. The vast majority of the discrete GPU market resides in the budget, mainstream, and mid-range market. You can take a look at the top 15 GPUs sold on Newegg and find the vast majority of those GPUs are from those tiers. Take a look at the Steam hardware survey and you see which GPUs are dominating the top spots. If RDNA 4 delivers solid price-to-performance ratios, it could sway those gamers to AMD's camp. Additionally, NVIDIA's dominant in the high-end market leaves AMD little room to compete directly. By avoiding this head-on confrontation, AMD can focus its resources on a segment where they have a better chance at succeeding. However, there are some glaring downsides to this approach. For starters, and I alluded to this at the beginning, AMD will have to have some really attractive products in each of those categories, and given the details we're hearing, I don't see how they're going to be able to achieve that. I'm talking about delivering RTX 4080 super levels of performance for under $500, and then go on from there where we have a $400 product that's potentially matching the 4070 Ti Super. For those of you thinking, wow, that's quite the goal. Well, in order for AMD to look attractive and not just, you know, have a small audience that already knows about them, I'm talking about the general consumers, they're going to have to find a way to send waves in the market. Because being on the same footing as NVIDIA when it comes to plain old raw rasterization and then undercutting them by like $50 or $100 isn't going to work out for them. And we have seen them try this before, it just didn't work out. The reason why AMD had success with the RX 480 was because at that time, a $550 GTX 980 was considered to be an enthusiast high-end GPU, and yet AMD found a way to deliver that performance for just $200 or less. However, with RDNA 1, they decided to just undercut NVIDIA by like $50 and call it a day while offering none of the extra features NVIDIA was offering. They will need to find a way to create a large headroom there when it comes to price to performance where even NVIDIA wouldn't be comfortable with sacrificing margins that low. NVIDIA likes to maintain their market leadership crown and right now they're making so much margin in the data center that they could forego that margin for their client products just to ensure they remain on top and then we'll just have the same repeating situation where people end up buying the NVIDIA product anyways and then nothing changes. And then it doesn't even have to be the data center saving them while they engage in a price war for those lower end segments. They can find a way to subsidize that through a 5080 and 5090 because they'll be the only options in those segments, so they'll price them sky high. Speaking of NVIDIA products, you have to consider why it is that people gravitate towards them, and that's really simply due to the software features and efficiency. Now, AMD has made strides in those areas, but they're always playing catch up, and despite progress being made, are still inferior when it comes to many of their implementations implementations from ray tracing, upscaling, frame gen, anti-lag, and so many other features. Having an exclusive, never-before-seen feature will get people interested in their products. It's not just about raw FPS anymore. Their software stack pales in comparison to what NVIDIA offers, and they can tie it back to gaming. Look at RTX Remix, the chat GPT gaming helper that they've uh, recently announced. So there's a lot of cool things that NVIDIA does, and uh, they always find a way to tie it back to their gaming GPUs. Jack also talked about how getting 40 to 50% market share is important for them as that gives them a more desirable foundation with developers. I personally feel like he was just peddling some BS here because they have the console market to themselves and also a lot of the handheld PC market. That alone should be a far larger contributor to 
to ensuring better development with game studios than the discrete GPU market. Take a look at the NVIDIA GeForce channel where they are constantly promoting large and notable titles that have just released or are on the way and they even include some indies here and there. So they have a much much more profound presence over AMD. Furthermore, having a Halo product does go a long way in facilitating a good image for your consumers, even if most of them can't afford your top tier product, they'll believe that the quality is going to be trickled down to a stack. It's why you have people overpaying for base model iPhones or MacBook Airs with a mere 8GB of memory and a 256GB SSD in 2024. So the high end parts, they play a crucial role in driving excitement and innovation within the gaming industry. If AMD gives up on the high end market entirely, this this could cede this important space to NVIDIA indefinitely, allowing NVIDIA to define the future of gaming graphics unchallenged. AMD at this stage has basically lost credibility with all high-end gamers because they are never going to be touching second fiddle. Now, a major external factor that is present for them, which can you know work in their favor, is that due to the current economic climate, people within the segment may be willing to forgo the features if it means they can be as frugal with their money as possible. Whether that's a difference of $50 to $150, I'm not so sure but the extent of that won't be realized until we see them on store shelves and also see what the public's reception is like. The release of the follow-up article on Tom's Hardware about AMD's uDNA announcement adds a new layer of complexity to this discussion. People were poking fun at this, saying that, you know, welcome back GCN, and I can certainly see the comedic factor in that. On the surface, this seems like a forward-thinking move that could create efficiencies in development and allow AMD to compete more effectively with NVIDIA's CUDA ecosystem. After all, NVIDIA has long enjoyed the advantages of a unified architecture, where its GPUs are capable of excelling in both gaming and AI-driven work. Loads. However, the timing of this announcement, coupled with AMD's focus on mid-range GPUs, feels a bit suspicious. It seems like a classic case of PR damage control, a way for AMD to pivot attention away from its struggles in the gaming market and highlight its success in other areas like AI and HPC. This raises the question, is AMD even focused on gaming anymore, or is this just a convenient way to placate investors while quietly shifting the focus to more lucrative AI and data center markets? From my perspective, it does look more like the Ladder. AMD has been making big moves in AI and HPC, and these markets represent huge revenue streams compared to gaming. You can see what they did with Zen 5, a server-based architecture that was basically ported over to the clientele side. While gaming remains important, it's clear that AMD's main focus is shifting towards enterprise solutions. The uDNA architecture might benefit gaming indirectly, but it seems like a secondary priority compared to the bigger picture. There's no denying that AMD's emphasis on AI and HPC makes sense from a business perspective. And NVIDIA has already proven that AI is the future, with its GPUs powering everything from large language models, self-driving cars, to advanced medical research. AMD wants a piece of that pie, and, and unifying its architecture with uDNA will allow it to compete more effectively in these growth markets. But what does this mean for gamers? Unfortunately, it could mean less innovation and fewer high-end options. If AMD is putting the majority of its resources into AI and the data center applications, gaming GPUs will likely take a backseat. The RDNA 4 strategy already reflects this, with AMD's decision to avoid the high-end segment and focus on more affordable options. This could lead to a stagnation in gaming graphics, especially if NVIDIA continues to dominate the high-performance space unchallenged. Moreover, AI-focused architectures are typically designed with different different priorities than gaming GPUs. AI workloads benefit from massive parallelism, precision, and energy efficiency, qualities that don't necessarily translate to better gaming performance. While AMD may leverage uDNA to improve gaming GPUs, there's a risk that their attention will be too divided or spread too thinly amongst different resources to deliver cutting-edge products in both areas. Perhaps I am jumping the gun a bit, but back when GCN was around, AMD did not give a shit about software, and in order to drive a unification strategy like this, you need a good, strong software foundation, which NVIDIA has. I do recall an article from Tech Power Up earlier this year where they had a discussion with AMD with how they're pivoting from being a hardware company to a software company. Why is Tesla a hotter stock than GM, who've been in the auto game for decades? That's because they don't have nearly the same level of software that Tesla does. It's the same thing with NVIDIA and AMD. AMD could discover a hardware breakthrough or phenomenon, but if they don't have the software to utilize it, then, you know, what good will that do? If you go back and take a look at, you know, older generations of cards like the Hawaii series, the R9 290s and 390Xs, their potential didn't become fully realized until much later when game developers were using stuff like asynchronous compute 
and hence you saw the term fine wine get invented. But you can't rely on stuff like that. You need to have a product that has good software to back it up today. But so far, it's all just talk from AMD. I can't help but feel that AMD's new strategy is more about placating investors and less about addressing the needs of gamers. The UDNA announcement, combined with AMD's pivot to mid-range and mainstream GPUs, gives the impression that gaming is becoming more of an afterthought for this company. With NVIDIA continuing to innovate at the high end and pushing new technologies like DLSS, ray tracing, AMD risks being left behind. I would argue even someone like Intel is doing more in this space than them. But of course, there's always the possibility that I'm wrong. Perhaps AMD's focus on the mid-range market will pay off, and they'll be able to deliver affordable, high-performance GPUs that resonate with gamers. However, based on their recent moves and increasing focus on all those markets, I'm just not convinced. For now, only time will tell if AMD's new strategy will pay off, but as a PC gamer and tech enthusiast, I can't help but feel a bit skeptical about this whole situation. Alrighty guys, so that's going to do it for this one. We'll touch base in the next video. If you guys found this video to be informative and entertaining, then leave a like. Let me know your thoughts and comments down below. Be sure to check out the video description for cool links and ways to support the channel, such as using my Amazon affiliate link. And if you're interested in seeing more content like this, then consider subscribing, I'd greatly appreciate it. Thank you guys so much for watching, take care and I'll see you in the next one.